I watched Dune Part 2 in four of the best and worst formats I could find. Yeah. Dune has been the biggest sci-fi hit in recent memory, and Dune 2 is poised to completely surpass it, and for very good reason. It is very, very good, and we will be talking all about that, but this has kind of been a little bit of an experience for me, because I found myself in a quandary with Dune Part 2. Unlike Part 1, which I was lucky enough to catch early in IMAX at a film festival, I was going to be stuck having my first Dune experience with either a, a little tiny baby screen with iffy audio, or on a bigger screen with speakers almost entirely blown out on certain bass registers. Like we're talking Kate Blanchett's voice going into a garbled mess. So I had a decision to make, wait a week until I was in Texas and see it in IMAX, or take my chances with the small theater and then see it in IMAX. And then my friend Zach made a suggestion that it would be cool to do it in both and compare the experiences, and I knew I had my answer, but I wanted to take it a step further. I wanted to try an experience doing in the best and worst ways that I could find and just see where that got me, for funsies. And I think it got a pretty good spread. We have a six story by 84 foot IMAX laser screen, the 40X near amusement park ride that's making people sick, the theater that hasn't been updated since the 90s and all the people are really nice but holy shit what is wrong with those speakers, and something questionable I acquired via airdrop through someone in line for the Fall Guy premiere. Yeah I know that doesn't include every version of this movie but there are basically like six different formats to try and track down and then there's just like poorly rated theaters because of the people that work there, then there's poorly rated theaters because of screen, but I neither have the money or the mental fortitude currently to handle that much travel. So in this video I'll be sharing a lot of my Dune 2 thoughts, starting with no spoilers, running through my different experiences, then talking about some of those like deeper details. So let us go on this journey through Arrakis together, ride the sandworm together, metaphorically, and kind of literally when you take 40x into account. And while we may not be able to surf on sandworms, we can surf on a shark with today's sponsor Surfshark, but like not literally, but like on the web. Surfshark VPN gives you the ability to connect to one of their thousands of different server locations so your internet thinks that's where you are. Say you want to watch Dune Part 1 right now, but oh no, it's not available where you are. Well, all you have to do is connect to a UK server location and boom, Dune for days. By now you guys should know that I use Surfshark all the time, whether I'm traveling and need to access my Canadian streaming services to help protect me on public Wi-Fi or just so I can watch things that aren't streaming in Canada, but I recently found an entire new use for it. And no, it's not because I was just in Texas trying to bypass some new Texas laws, get your head out of the gutter. While traveling recently, suddenly my YouTube premium wasn't letting me use background or lock screen play. It was maddening, let me waste my life away listening to YouTube videos while browsing Reddit in peace. I kind of assumed it might have been a glitch, but the second I connected to a Canadian server location, the problem was solved. It's incredible that this far into my relationship with Surfshark, I am still finding ways they help me not want to put my head through a wall. Surfshark is fast, secure, blocks unwanted ads, and if you want to try it out for your yourself, make sure to click the link in the description down below and use code JEDI to get up to an additional three months free. So my first Dune video was actually a pretty light review and rundown on what I thought with no major spoilers, kind of going through the ways it felt similar to so many other iconic sci-fi heroes journeys and chosen one tales, while also being very obvious that it was going to subvert all those tropes. Paul's a false prophet, a fabricated legend, and it's all about what gets him to that point of believing his own legend, and the whole story is really a warning against these messiah-like figures. And that's just putting it very lightly. I know there's so much more nuance from the book lore, but point being, Jessica orchestrated Paul matching the prophecy. And I was firmly in the camp of, this movie's great, but if part two sucks, it isn't gonna feel satisfying. The whole thing is just this massive setup that ends right as most movies would be getting into the meat. But thankfully, Denis Villeneuve is an amazing Canadian treasure that we're sharing with the world, and he understood the assignment. The perfect blend of dense storytelling, beautiful visuals, and vibes means that part two is perfectly tugging on all those threads set up in part one. Which is is great because this isn't a sequel, this is the second half of the movie come to deliver a genuine part Two. But doing some light setup for the movie with no spoilers, we pick up pretty much exactly where we left off. Jessica and Paul traveling with the Fremen after Paul gets his first kill, starting the trajectory to his downfall. Or ascendancy, depending on how you want to take it. While Jessica is still firmly on the path to build him up as the Lisan al Gaib, the voice from the outer world, Paul's only interested in gaining the Fremen loyalty so he can get revenge for his father's fallen Atreides empire, betrayed by the emperor himself. And it's just so interesting to watch all of this play out and shift the religious fanaticism that we know the Bene Gesserit set up and have been spreading around Arrakis and other cultures for centuries. On Arrakis, we have done all we can for you. 
Let's hope he doesn't squander it. How Jessica decided it was time to cash in on all that when they were being sent to Arrakis, changing the intention of so many Bene Gesserit plans. I love watching that build up at every different step, the unwilling hero primed to become a dictator, manipulating an entire people group to fight his war with the promise of paradise on the other side. But our hero is not a hero. And it's just genuinely a delight to pull out new details every time I watch it. I don't think it's a perfect movie. I do have some issues with how the plot progresses in areas towards the end, but I will say it feels less abrupt with each rewatch and the last hour plus of this thing is just so incredible once you're not as hung up on wondering whether an aspect of a story might have come about too quickly. But that brings us to my first experience with this movie, which after all that debate did end up being in IMAX because my car wouldn't start the day I was supposed to see it back home. I am holding my life together with a thread right now. But that experience was incredible. We saw it at the Bullock Museum IMAX, which is one of the screens that's considered real IMAX, not the LIMAX I've seen people throwing around. We got 12 channel audio, 1.43 to 1 aspect ratio laser screen. It was gorgeous and so immersive. Just a great place. I was also lucky enough to catch Civil War there like the last week. It really just let Denny's vision shine. Which moments fully opened up for the impact, moments you expect it to happen, then you realize he's holding it back for the next moment to really hit that impact. The depth, how real everything looks because of the clear vision of design and colors, just breathtaking in scope, the subtle glow and shimmer to the spice. It's beautiful. Then you look at Getty Prime, the Harkonnen planet. They have a black sun that Denny chose to imbue with like swirling pockets of infrared waves that make anyone outside look like they're just perfectly black and white, which just adds into the mythology of the Harkonnens and how brutal they are on a visual level. They even shot all these scenes with an infrared camera, so it's just a full lack of color here. They're not taking away color in post. It makes for so many incredible scenes where people were walking from inside to outside and just totally draining of any color. I do kind of wish that that had been my second time seeing it, so I could have paid way more attention to those visual cues and moments and details, but it was still a gorgeous spectacle. But before diving into the story, let's have a look at those performances and new characters. Unsurprisingly, I feel like this is some of Timmy's best work. There's some line delivery in this that is just so genuinely great and chilling. Even in moments, you feel like something may have progressed too fast. He's just owning it. And considering so much of it's happening in the Fremen language and it's still all so memorable, what he's saying is really impressive stuff. I know that Denis specifically said he would keep doing takes over and over until the dialect they'd created was correct, and that just shows a massive care for what's happening here. Zendaya brings so much heart and passion to her role. Chani has so much faith in Paul, but also a lot of fear because of what the rest of the world believes him to be, and she balances that perfectly. Villeneuve specifically made her a more prominent character in this movie to stand as a counter to Paul, someone who loves him, but not as a god. And she's great in the entire movie, but shines so vividly in that second half. Like, her anger is palpable. Her sorrow, both for what's happening with Paul and how it's all being used against her people, just furiously trying to reason with them to no effect. I kind of believe and wouldn't be surprised if the next movie saw more of like a split protagonist thing with her and Paul, so we will have to see. Rebecca Ferguson is fantastic as always, but also kind of terrifying because she quickly becomes a different person, which I'll get to, but she nails it. She's very unsettling. I don't know if I've ever unvibed with someone so quickly. Then one of the more anticipated new cast members popping up is Florence Pugh as Princess Irulan, daughter of the Emperor, and she basically kicks the movie off, logging the events she's heard of the Atreides house falling on Arrakis, why it happened, and its potential effects. And it's really fun to see how in tune she is with all this, even if she's not specifically being looped in, realizing how all-encompassing the Bene Gesserit control actually is and how far they'll go to maintain that power and their plans. These are our own religious patterns, aren't they? This is our doing. What if Paula Treaties were still alive? Enough! She's also just an incredible actress. Like, we all know that, but there's this moment at the end where she just looks at Chani and realizes something, which I'll talk about later, and it is so good. Like, so much said with just eyes and a mouth movement. I'm, I'm just so excited to see more of her going forward. And the other big ticket introduction was Austin Butler as Fade Rotha, the Baron's nephew, and he is menacing as all hell, absolutely unhinged, horny for violence, but I actually have a fairly hard time separating Austin from the character. He kind of makes me giggle a bit. I feel like that's definitely a me thing though. He is really great in the movie. He really becomes the character and even models his speech pattern after Skarsgård, so you can believe that they're related. It's very good work. Hopefully he doesn't get stuck with that voice. And last but certainly not least is Javier Bardem's returning Stilgar. He is so interesting here because he's genuinely funny in so many moments of this movie. Like the Lisa and Al Gaib stuff took such a foothold that people started mass making memes and they're all fantastic. Because it does just become this thing that no matter what Paul does or says, it's a sign that he's fitting the prophecy. It doesn't even matter if Paul doesn't believe, he believes. I don't care what you believe, I believe. But in the comedy that comes from those moments of him believing with so much certainty 
that Paul is this godlike savior they've been waiting for comes the horrific reality that he's been raised to believe in this fabricated prophecy that's going to set so many of his people up to die to worship a man boy a boy man just just totally manipulated for generations all things we've seen happen in our reality they're really not trying to hide the inspiration for these various groups of people countries just become planets in the dune universe and him in this movie once again just made me think about how much dune really inspired other sci-fi stories and just fantasy in general like when stilgar is saying that he found the lisan al gaib and the other people around him that he's revealing this to are like again it's just so damn funny that literally so many people could have fit the criteria that he's gone through this multiple times and it makes stories that genuinely have chosen ones seem even more goofy. I say that as a Phantom Menace truther. Though I will mention, while the prophecy of the Lisan al-Gaib is all a fabrication, Paul does have superhuman abilities. I know that's something that's been like confusing people. He's had visions of possible futures that were progressively getting worse his whole life. His mother has trained him in the Bene Gesserit ways, which weren't allowed for men, and that specifically set him up to be something known as the Kwisatz Haderach. I'm sorry, I totally butchered that, but it's a male with the abilities of a Bene Gesserit who would also be able to bridge ancestral memories of both men and women and use their prescience to understand the past, present, and future potential events. Like a souped up Bran Stark. And whoever takes the helm with these abilities would help put in motion the actions required for a better future, as horrific as they may be to get there, and lead to almost total Bene Gesserit control. It kind of seems like their initial intentions were never great, but they've been further corrupted by this desire for power. But Paul isn't really interested in playing into the prophecy to be their prophet. It, he just wants them on his side for revenge. But then he quickly starts to actually respect and appreciate their culture and uses his prescience to help with that while believing that the Fremen should rule themselves in the battle to reclaim Arrakis. One of the coolest scenes in this movie of Paul earning his place amongst the Fremen is learning how to ride the sandworm, which is a good time to introduce my second theater experience, 4DX. It wasn't until I was already in Texas that I heard that this was a thing. I've been to 3DX. 4DX apparently takes it a step further as a borderline amusement amusement park ride. I saw reports of people getting sick, wanting to leave within 10 minutes, being bruised, spilling drinks and food all over themselves, and if you don't spill, the seats spit at you. So I knew I had to make some time on my schedule to watch it, and good lord. 3DX gives you independent control of your own seat. 4DX is just sections of four chairs running on a track. There is no way to control your experience or shut it off, except the water. Apparently you can shut that off. That's how I knew the spitting was real. And yeah, it actually gets pretty violent at times. Like, it's decently fun at first, like someone gets sniped, I get blasted in the head with an air shot. For a bit though, I did think that like, the water feature was actually the air I was feeling, like maybe it was some kind of water-powered hydraulic air, but that's because there's so little water in Dune, I didn't get spit on until they cut to a planet with rain. And yeah, there was a little drizzle. It was very drippy. I wonder if they ever do it with Jurassic Park and then like you get you get blasted in the face with water when, when Lex gets sneezed on. That's the immersive cinema experience we all need. Anyway, I feel like the sandworm riding scene gives you the best feel for the full 4DX experience, minus the water feature. That is that is not present in the sand. For one, the scene itself is way more intense than it had any right being. It took Paul so long to fall down and hook on that body that I almost thought he was going to miss it entirely. Even without the 4DX, that scene is epic and immersive, but with it, it becomes a genuine struggle. Like I was getting thrown around so much that I thought I was gonna fall out of my seat before Paul potentially fell off the worm. The jolts, the tilts, the wind blowing at me in every direction as if I'm right there with him on that worm. It's an experience for sure. These scenes also introduced a layer I was not at all expecting. Anytime a lot of sand was blowing around, the theater would just start releasing smoke. And it looked pretty sick on the screen as the light had to project through it, but the whole place got so hazy. Like imagine if you're watching a movie that had some kind of toxic gas at play, it would feel even more immersive and concerning. Here it mainly encouraged a girl to start ripping the fattest vapes, like not even when the movie was choosing to pop up the smoke, just all throughout the last hour or more of the movie, just absurd behavior. You can probably tell that this was a much less direct story engaged viewing from me. I spent a good chunk trying to document the experience for this video and then other massive chunk is just trying to adjust to how you're being thrown around anytime any degree of action is happening. Some of those battle scenes, the explosions, I genuinely felt like I got a mild form of whiplash. My neck stiffened right up. I got a horrible headache, a little bit dizzy and disoriented. Literally felt like my brain was rattling around in my skull and I've sustained too many head injuries in my life to encourage that kind of behavior. Behavior, but I have no regrets. I certainly got my money's worth in action, but I just don't know if the human body should be experiencing that level of sustained throttling. Don't 
don't go for the innuendo. I do still think it's an experience worth having at least once. Like, I feel like maybe a racing or a flying movie would be the most fluid and fun, but I have no regrets with my first experience being Dune 2. And before anyone gets on my case for recording, I was in the back of the theater. I purposely booked a seat behind everyone else. I had a cover on my screen, no brightness on, no one even glanced in my direction. I only tried to record so much because there was no one around me to notice. And it's kind of hard to describe exactly how much this thing is rumbling you around without that evidence. So. You're welcome. Now, diving back into the story with, I guess maybe these are getting into some light spoilers, but this still all happened within, you know, the first 20 minutes of the movie. I, I mentioned that Jessica essentially becomes a different character, and that's because she kind of completely snapped after drinking worm piss. Sorry, I mean, the water of life. I think it's actually worm bile, as if that makes it any better, but one Fremen girl calls it worm piss, and that's more fun for me. Is it wrong that my head is trying to figure out if worm piss or worm bile would taste worse? Either way, it's poison. Stilgar basically hits her with the ultimatum. If you don't become our new reverend mother, Paul must not be the Lisan al-Gaib, and you'll be of no use to us anymore. Drink the worm piss or die, basically. She then has to convert this poison in the body to be harmless, which would unlock the genetic memories of her female ancestors, as well as taking on the memories of the existing Fremen mother. And the result is her becoming a creepy little weirdo, spewing more about how Paul needs to drink it now too, so he can become the Kwisatz Haderach. I'm gonna say that just increasingly more. It's like the Kwisatz, the Kwisatz Haderach. And the bigger issue, she's got a little baby growing inside her and the poison opens the fetus's mind too. They have conversations now. Totally normal stuff here, guys, keep up. Obviously there's something terribly wrong with the fetus gaining any degree of prescience and the existing Reverend Mother is clearly horrified and it could have just been that they were worried that the baby was gonna die, but you know, Reverend Mothers don't seem to care about that too much. I really do think it was more likely because of the wild implications this has. It's a fetus that now has knowledge that was accumulated over centuries and the ability to process it. I don't know what's gonna happen with her going forward, but I heard she'll age faster as a result. So we've got a little Renesmee brewing here. They better not try to stick Anya Taylor-Joy's face on a child to achieve that. Robot or bust. Now the rest of this movie is, as expected, pretty dense with plot. So before I start getting into some of those specific things that I liked and some of the spoilers, let's round out my other viewing experiences. Bringing us to this one, the weird airdropped copy with echoey audio, bad color and lighting experience through a 6.12 inch screen. And yeah, it's not great. Like it's definitely serviceable as a way to like double check some details or win an argument about how Paul pulled something off later in the movie. But even with all that working against it, even with, with this being the last experience I'd recommend, even if you were able to put it on a bigger screen, I'd still not recommend doing it. The movie's just good. Film is a visual medium. So what you see does matter, but those directional and visual choices are all still there, even if they don't look as intended. I would never recommend seeing a movie in this format for so many different reasons, and even if the only one that matters to you is, is gonna be a lame way to watch it. But with Dune 2 in particular, this movie has easily earned your admission fee. And it's obviously just gonna be a more enjoyable experience seeing it, witnessing it properly on a big screen versus just the fastest freeway you can track it down. Even if your theater's not great, it's still gonna be better than this. So I decided I wanted to give it one more proper watch. In that format, I meant to start it all off with the theater that hasn't really been upgraded much since the 90s with blown out speakers, an experience that many of you may also be stuck with. Obviously for the proper theater experience in terms of quality, this one was the worst, but still not bad by any means. The screen may not have been as vibrant, the seats not as plush, and if someone tall sat in front of me, it would have been all over for my visibility. And my God, those damn speakers, it's a real problem. Florence Pugh's voice was enough to make them garble out a bit. But again, still good, still a great movie, still a great and incredibly engaging experience. Experience. If that had been my only option, I still would have had a blast and deeply appreciated this piece of work. As incredible as those visuals are, visuals aren't enough to carry a story in its entirety to keep it interesting and engaging. I don't know how many people who can keep that much lore flowing so smooth in a way that both makes it so that you can understand everything that's happening while you're watching, but encourages you to go out and find supplemental information afterwards. So yeah, I experienced Dune 2 in many ways, watched it start to finish four times, and it never failed to engage me, it's never not been interesting, and that's an achievement. So yeah, for whatever reason you were still on the fence about watching this movie, if you even remotely enjoyed the first one, I would definitely recommend it. But now let us veer off into some spoilers and more specific thoughts. So as mentioned, the big follow-up from Jessica drinking the poison is she is now like way harder on this idea that Paul needs to be seen as the prophet. They need to fulfill the prophecy, and he specifically needs to make the final step to 
become the Kwisatz Haderach. And he is not remotely on board with this. So while she travels south to go be with the more religiously fundamental of the Fremen to make sure that they're primed to accept Paul, he is just completely avoiding the entire place because he knows following her will lead to the galactic genocide of billions in his name. And while all this is happening, the Harkonnens are trying to reclaim their spice production and we get introduced to Fade Rotha, who is now being set up to take over Arrakis because of Robin's failures and he is completely psychotic. He takes great delight in murder, even when fights start to not go his way. And like Paul, he's also part of the Bene Gesserit's long-standing breeding program. They were going to orchestrate a union between him and the promised Atreides' daughter to produce the Kwisatz Haderach. So Paul being born instead jumps the timeline up if he becomes it instead. Again, this figure in the Bene Gesserit lore is real and it is the end point to their powers. There's just a lot of options of who they could set it up to be. That's real. Prophecy is not. It's just something that they have in place across a bunch of different planets to make sure a Bene Gesserit will always be able to have safety, protection, and a foothold. And because Paul ruins these plans and is basically guaranteed some kind of fight between the two, a different Bene Gesserit played by Leia Sadu steps up to secure the bloodline by taking on Fade's baby. She's another creepy little weirdo in this. They're basically like, yeah, we're just gonna like pop you in, just like have sex real quick and like get pregnant and like that'll be good. And the other half of the plan is having Irulan marry Fade to maintain her power in the event her father loses the empire for killing off the Atreides. And Fade is much more effective in his campaigns to destroy the Fremen. And it's around here that we kind of get that, that abrupt shift in Paul. He spent the whole movie avoiding his potential destiny as a prophet and the KH because all he sees on the other side of that is death and destruction. We do know that the visions are all just like possible outcomes and they're not always one to one. Like he sees Jamis kill him in the first movie, but he kills Jamis and then his vision fighting ends up being paralleled by Chani here. And the scene of them overlooking Kaladin and dark clothes seems to have Jamis in the background as well as scenes of Jamis being a sort of mentor to him before they ever cross paths, which to me suggests an alternate timeline where he and Jamis never get in that fight and it's Stilgar that dies instead. Which led me down another thought path. Early on, Stilgar warns Paul of desert djinn who exists to lead people astray. So the first time he thinks he sees Jamis, it's actually Chani, but the second time it is a Jamis vision encouraging him to see more, which is exactly what would happen if he drank the poison. The one thing he's been desperately avoiding. So is this a vision of a reality where Jamis didn't die, where he may have been a mentor to Paul, pulling him down the only path that remains? Or is this a djinn leading him astray right into the path of destruction as the ancestral voices tell him to drink the water of life, which of course the Bene Gesserit would tell him to do. That might all be addressed in the book. I might be way off. I just think it's interesting that they specifically mention djinn as a concept and then have the first person Paul ever killed urging him to do the one thing he's been trying to avoid. But it still just felt so abrupt to me. Like he's been very firm and not going south and not taking too much leadership over the Fremen, enraged with his mother. We gave them something to hope for. That's not hope! Even telling off Gurney, who is not in fact dead and just upset that Paul isn't wielding the 200 Fremen warrior he has. All my visions lead to horror because you lose control because I gain it. Choosing instead to exist as this Batman-style myth of the Muad'Dib working his way through the Harkonnen, spreading fear. Muad'Dib means kangaroo mouse. An unusual warning for a Fremen. I get that things have escalated because Fade Rotha has been decimating Fremen homes and their holy areas, but the only option he sees going south is a holy war. And not because he loses control, specifically because he gains it. So, of course, he goes south and drinks the piss. And Jessica's just like freeballing the Bene Gesserit stuff now. She literally uses her voice to manipulate Chani into like fulfilling part of the prophecy. So, her other name, Chani's, is Sahaya, which means desert spring. And there's a line in the prophecy that says, He shall come back from the death with Desert Spring Tears. One more piece in the fanaticism for Stilgar to be so sure they have their profit. Listen, I gave! Even though Jessica was the one who forced her into doing it. Leaving me to wonder if the drop just jumped him out of his prescience, he's just having a conversation with his now grown up super aware sister, or if Jessica mentally woke him up, who knows? So Paul's now essentially become the Kwisatz Haderach. He is equipped with intense prescience. He is breaking down the lines of like time and space. It's like a very Doctor Strange moment of him being able to like look 
look through millions of different options and seeing the sliver where they can succeed. And for Paul, that means doing all the things he promised to never do. A warrior religion that waged the Atreides banner in my father's name. A war in my name! Because he now officially believes his own hype and has centuries of knowledge. He even knows that his mother was the unwanted daughter of Baron Harkonnen, which she didn't even know until she drank the poison, which means he's actually part of two royal family lines. And he believes the key to surviving is to be more like the Harkonnen, more brutal, abandoning the ways of the Fremen, no longer even taking the water from their dead bodies for the cooling systems and simply burning them in mass piles like the Harkonnen do. And when I say he changes, it is like a switch flip, just like with Jessica. Like he now openly states his superiority over the Fremen, promising to deliver on their prophecy while Chani just screams in vain about how it enslaves them. Like I knew Paul was gonna go this way, but I really thought it was gonna take more than some worm piss to flip that switch. I kind of thought it was gonna be a, a gradual decline that way through revenge and other weird things. Not that he's suddenly like, yeah, I'm that bitch. You pray to your grandmother. So now we're officially in the political takeover territory. Paul manipulated the emperor to Arrakis and captured him while overthrowing the Harkonnen. And this is where all of Chani's fears come true. Paul's taken the mantle as the Lisan al Gaib of a fake prophecy to use her people in his wars. And he proposes a marriage arrangement with the princess to maintain the emperor's family power, but restore and ascend the Atreides to the top position. I am Paul Bladim Atreides, Duke of Arrakis. This is where we get that look from Florence that you just know she can tell there's something going on between the two of them, but she's also willing to do anything to save her father, and the alternative was having to marry this psycho, so Paul's a treat. Are you prepared? You've been preparing me my whole life. Oh, well, Johnny's still wearing her blue armband to signify that she's in love. It's just brutal stuff here. And just like part one, this all comes ahead with a one-on-one -on -one battle. Fade Rotha steps in to fight on behalf of the Emperor, and Paul refuses to let Stilgar take his place. Place. And I love how this scene was shot. We get the nod to Duncan. May thy knife chip and shatter. It's so close and tense and violent. You can tell they worked on the choreography extensively. I'm sure a lot of people were like, I don't know how legible this is going to be on screen with how fast and close they're moving, but it is so good. Obviously, Paul comes out on top, but not before he gets stabbed twice, but he has to let it happen to get the upper hand. That tiny sliver ahead he saw on the path. I just got a comment though. Fade looked horny when Paul killed the Baron, then finds out they're cousins and honestly seems even more horny once he gets stabbed by Paul. <laughs> leaving this one shot of everyone kneeling for him except Irulan and Shani. God, it's good. Not smooth sailing though, as expected. The other leaders aren't so willing to accept his ascendancy to emperor, so it's time to head to war, which he describes as leading them to paradise. God, everyone sucks so much except Chani. And one thing I really like is that they make the choice to leave Chani behind. Apparently in the book, she's fine to be around as his concubine, but Veniv really seems to be setting her up for more. That's why I have theories that she might kind of be her own protagonist in the next installment. Some of the things I liked were the Reverend Mother trying to get Paul in line and just getting hit with the voice. Consider what you're about to do, Paul Atreides. Silence! In Dune, Abomination is specifically what the Bene Gesserit call anyone they believe isn't controlling their ego memories, and it's probably why they were concerned with the unborn child, because as I assumed, an unborn child having that much knowledge and awareness just can't be good. Now, I assume she sees Paul as an abomination, not necessarily because he's actually lost control, but because he's just not under her control. Paul being willing to blow up all the spice fields may not be smart, but his ability and willingness to do so gives him a lot more power over the situation. I saw some people assume it goes even deeper that she's like feeling the fetus's influence as the abomination, but no confirmation of that. And that's how it ends with the Fremen being brought off Arrakis to fight the Holy War with the final shot being Chani's rage. Obviously so much more happens in this movie that I've probably not mentioned. I'm sure there's a lot of things I missed and a lot of nuance I've excluded either because I don't know about it or I just didn't feel like I needed to. Though I'd like to approach both these movies with as little knowledge as possible. I still haven't read the books. Uh, and then I like to try to learn some of the lore that builds into whatever was used in the movie though, I may now officially move my way into the books. I think I'm safe to at least read the first Dune and see what areas Denny's made changes because so far from what I've heard, I seem to really enjoy the changes he's chosen to make. But that's going to do it for today's video. Let me know your thoughts down below. This ended up being a lot longer than I thought. What format did you watch it in? What was your favorite format to watch Dune 2 in? Thank you all so much for watching and thanks as always to my Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. All my social medias are listed down below if you want to follow me there. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay, and we'll catch you all later.